Sound of the Radio with your host, JT. Yeah, fucking Jen is a warlord. Only by example, man. Because there's a difference between uh, what the great Roberto Unger calls um, biographical time and historical time. All of us are born in circumstances not of our own choosing. We're only here for so long. We all have insecurities, anxieties, and fears, knowing that our bodies will undergo extinction one day very soon. And therefore, to deal with those insecurities and fears and anxieties, you have to have certain structures of feeling and value that give you some sense of worthwhileness as you move through time, from mother's womb to tomb, right? And it's only in biographical time, because we only got one life this side of Jordan. And there's no person who's a Messiah. Now, these people will tell you they are, but you say, <laughs> okay, just go to be self-deceived and drink your cognac and keep moving. Because <laughs> there's no messiahs out there. There's no saviors out there. There's no messiahs in groups. There's no messiahs in collectivities. There's only lives to be lived. We back to check off again. Mm. Lives to be lived, acknowledging things were in place before we arrived. So therefore, we ought to have gratitude for the love that we received. I mean, I, that's how I begin my, my whole life. I am who I am because somebody loved me. It's mom, it's dad, it's my brothers, my sisters, it's my friends, right? And I don't deserve it. And I have to somehow follow in Ashford, Wins Ashford and Simpson. They say, send it like a puff of smoke. You got to let it go. Spread whatever love justice by example. Examples are the gold card of justice. That's a wonderful line in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Examples, Examples are the gold card of judgment. The judgments we make are predicated on the examples that we have. And we must have examples of greatness. If you're going to be a classical composer, you better study some Ludwig Beethoven. Mm. If you're going to be a serious artist of the musical theater, you better study a genius who's still alive named Stephen Sondheim. Mm. From West Side Story to Company to Sunday in the Park with George to Passion to Sweeney Todd across the board. Not to imitate, but just to know what greatness is in your genre. Oh. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Ramble for Radio. I am your host, Gen T. Twitter and Instagram at Gen T523. I'm blown away from that quote from Dr. Cornell on Joe Rogan. Whew. Whew. Dr. Cornell West was on Joe Rogan this week, and I highly, highly, highly recommend that you go back. If you don't listen to anything, listen to Dr. Cornell West on Joe Rogan. It is a fantastic interview. I might not agree with everything that he said on there, but regardless, in the two-hour time frame, I was, I was fascinated by Dr. Cornell West and Joe Rogan and their conversation they had. And the reason being is it's not that often that I have conversations where you're thinking. Most of the conversations that I'm having with people are very transactional. It's, oh, I haven't pooped in three weeks. I need something. Oh. So it's super cool to occasionally get a conversation that makes you think. On Saturdays, I have my instructor training at uh, my gym and with my sensei. And a lot of the conversations that we have are thoughtful, really get the wheels turning as far as I'll be thinking these thoughts, but I won't say them out loud. And then I walk into the classroom and then he says that. And I'm like, whoa, I was thinking that. And now you're saying it. So I'm not crazy as much as I thought. Um, so having these thoughtful conversations is like exercise for my brain. I'm not just going to the gym to just get exercise for my body, which I am, but 
it's also helpful to have my brain get some exercise. It's just towards the end of the week, it just feels like mush. These uh, people who ask questions at my work, which, you know, it's, you're thinking somebody's asking you a question, you know, you would want to be helpful. But in actuality, almost 90% of the people that I interact with, and that's a lot at work, they aren't really asking, and I'm being generous when I say 90, they aren't really asking a question to get a thought provoking answer. They're just asking a question to confirm what they're already going to do. They're not really interested in what you actually have to say, which I find that completely psychotic because you're coming into a store, you're asking a nutritional consultant or you're asking a store clerk to help you with something because you probably don't know what you're doing. And yet when you get a well thought out answer, an educated answer, you don't like that. Matter of fact, it makes you upset. So most people, when they ask you a question, or at least in my case, they're just asking a question to confirm what they're already going to do anyways. It doesn't matter what you're saying. They're already going to do what they set out to do. Like uh, for the dude who had the bloody stools last week, uh, blue hat, blue jeans, blue, blue shirt, blue jacket guy. He was already set in his mind that he wanted to start a new diet. And the way that he would do that is eating only molasses and then is having bloody stools. I know here we are back to the bloody stool guy. Sorry, TMI. Anyhow, he asked me if that was a good idea. Well, sir, you're over 60 years old. Do you think just only eating molasses is a good idea? Honestly, honestly, your answer should be no. Instead, you're trying to start the next craze of I lost weight eating molasses, which actual in actuality, you're pooping out blood. You're starving yourself because you're not getting any foundations of nutrition. You're not getting any uh, protein out of molasses. You're only getting sugar and carbs, basically, if that. So <sighs> the fact that there are so many people out there who are afraid to have their thoughts or ideas challenged is disturbing to me. The reason why I, one of the reasons why I started this podcast was to get out my thoughts and ideas and to hear them and hear other people uh, feedback, other people give me feedback about my thoughts and ideas and then go from there. See, see how it felt. Um, if I was getting too much negative on something, then I would take it out of the show. Like apparently there are two, <laughs> two women listeners to the show and they have told me they hate it when I talk about sports. They don't know what's going on and it makes them want to turn this off. So you noticed I have pretty much stopped talking about sports on here. Not because I um, am trying to cater to them, but I'm trying to keep everyone on board. And it seems like when I don't talk about sports, people like the show, particularly to these two ladies. So I'm trying to get both sides in here. I know guys don't care either way. Y'all are sitting here or y'all are doing something or you're at the gym or you're doing whatever. And this is just background noise. I get it. I guess my point is, is that I, I'm trying to be constructive. I'm trying to be more thoughtful and open with my life. And what Dr. Cornell was saying is that we're all insecure. We're all afraid. When I started the show two years ago, two and a half years ago, the month before, I was having dreams about doing a podcast. I was having dreams about doing it, and I kept telling myself, no, you can't do this. No, you're not good enough. No, 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 and no. And it was because I was insecure and I was concerned about, oh, what would people think of me? And, oh, if I say this, then this is going to alienate some people to the point flash forward to where I'm at now, where I'm like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I don't really care. I mean, you're, I, I value certain people's opinions and I respect that, but I also know that how I feel when I, when I, when I podcast, when I speak from the heart when I'm honest, whether it's super disgusting TMI kind of stuff to intellectual stuff like what I played before the show. 
I would like to have a sense of honesty about my life. And this is why I have this show is to be honest with myself. And because I'm honest with myself, that means that I can maybe share my honesty with others. You don't necessarily have to accept my honesty, which I have (laughs) experienced that. (laughs) Some people are not ready for the truth. I get it. But I'm hoping that I can pass on various things that I hear or tips that I can share on this show with all, what are we at? We're at 150 people, I guess, and only two of them are women. (laughs) Oh, damn it. (laughs) Hopefully those two are not future exes, okay? (laughs) That's after last week. Holy shit. But that's neither here nor there. I guess my point is, is I'm trying to display my most authentic self. I am insecure. I am full of fear. I am doing much better with my anxiety since I started the show. I used to be a very anxious person. And then I started to discover these patterns based on the behavior that my dad demonstrates, which is he's an extremely anxious person. He took one giant risk in his life. Okay, maybe two. (laughs) <laughs> impregnating my mom um, and having me <laughs> and keeping me. Um, okay, three. <laughs> okay, four. <laughs> but after that, everything is, you can't do that. This and this will happen. There are consequences. This is this. Is, <laughs> A lot of my father's life, or at least the years that I've been around, the, the last couple of years that I've witnessed, is coming from a place of insecurity. Um, I don't want to go on a family trip. I, I like my home. I don't want to go to this place. I can't do what I do at home. I want to stay home. Um, uh, don't go there. This and this will happen because you're a woman. If you go out at this time of night, this is going to happen to you because you're a woman. Um, don't dress like this. People are going to call you a dyke. Okay, dad, we get it. But the point is we need to live an authentic life and be ourselves. And if we keep say no and keep putting parameters, you're not being authentic. You're not being true to yourself. And that stifens your ability to grow as a person. And my whole journey that I'm starting to get into is a lot of people say, oh, you're so nice. How are you so nice? Or this is why this happens to you because you're so nice. Well, I'm trying to be nice based on the past experiences that I've had and people being so mean to me that my only solution I feel is to be even nicer because of the treatment that I've received in my past. Yes, I... I look in the mirror and I don't like what I see. Yes, I'm overweight. Yes, I do go to the gym, but I also am... You know, I'm an emotional eater. I struggle with that all the time. I have good, so I have great weeks and then I have horrible, horrible weeks. But that's part of life. That's part of my journey. And I understand that I need, I identify what those triggers are that makes me want to eat the experiences that I'm experiencing, the environment. And it's also just flat out me rewiring my brain. Like my teacher says, there's there's habits that you've wired your brain to to a point where it just does it automatically. And so f- in order for you to correct a habit, you have to build a new circuit. So I'm working on building new circuits every day for bad habits that I have. And I'm not the only one. You listening, you have bad habits too. Dump you all. Mm-hmm, girl, you got bad habit. No, we all have them. It's, it's, it's what, uh, it's our, it's our security blanket until we rip it off and go to the next level. We all have our insecurities and fears, but the biggest thing for me is trying to live a life of an example. And even though in my past people have been super fucked up to me and I've done some super fucked up shit, I've also realized that the nicer I am, that makes other people want to be nice in a way, in a roundabout way. Sometimes it doesn't work. I get it. Um, some people are just deeply rooted in shitty experiences happening to them in their past. So they want to create other shitty experiences for other people. I get it. But that doesn't mean you have to do it. We all have a choice. And I choose to 
and be nice to people because that makes me feel good and that makes the person feel good and they'll take that niceness, hopefully, and spread that niceness to other people in their family or in their community or in their neighborhood or even just with their spouse or their partner, staking a dick suck, we're going downtown to the badge. cool, hey, let's all be nice to each other. Share the love that you receive. Give. Don't always take. We live in a society where we take, 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 take. How about we give, 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 give. Give, give, give. A lot. A lot of love. Give a lot of love. Um, also, whew, whew, let's see. Another idea that Cornell talked, Dr. Cornell West talked on was no one is the Messiah. No person is the Messiah. And how I took that as is that nobody is going to save you from yourself but you. You can only save yourself. If you're stuck in a situation, you can't fucking figure it out. Stop. Don't just keep doing it just because you think that's the only way. Like the last month, I have been going and getting ice cream every other day. Ice cream, ice cream. And I know that ice cream is counterproductive to my weight loss program. And for some reason, my habit in my brain is like, oh, it's been 103 this whole week. I need ice cream. I'll feel better. Yes, I feel better. But then the pounds come back on. I don't like my body. So how is eating ice cream helping me? It's not. It's not making me feel good. It does temporarily, but it's not the same as how the emotions I feel when I look in the mirror and I'm like, ugh, my body is getting worse. How is this possible? Oh, yeah. I've been eating ice cream for fucking three weeks. All right. Cool. Not. So knowing that, identifying that problem and coming up with solution to that is stop buying fucking ice cream just because it's hot. Buy some fruit. Have water. Go to the gym. There's a pool at the gym. Go swimming. There are other solutions to this problem. But because I've been a big baby about it and been like, oh, it's too hot. Oh. I've been like Moto Kenzo. Oh, it's so hot. It's racist. <laughs> Where you just use throw the racist word in every little thing. Oh, you eat ice cream every day. You're racist. <laughs> oh, Jen, you don't date black chicks. You're a racist. Oh, my God. Brother, it's called a preference. It's a preference, fam. I don't expect you to date black people, but if you do, cool, that's for you. I don't want that, okay? And to sit there and call me a racist, ugh, shame on you. <laughs> and maybe I am, you son of a bitch. What are you going to do about it? Nothing. <laughs> ah, good old Moto Kenzo. <laughs> Repopra, Repopra, I heard, I heard people telling me you're talking shit on me again. Yeah, it's great radio because you tell me dumb stuff. You say stupid stuff. And then I have to <laughs> complain about you on the air. <laughs> oh, oh, God. God bless Moto Kenzo. And shout out to Moto Kenzo. Apparently some thugs broke into his car. Sorry about that. You know. Back to what I was saying. I'm eating ice cream because it's hot. Okay, that's a problem. Here's a solution. I bought some fruit. I brought some strawberries. I love strawberries. Eat some strawberries instead. Put them in the freezer. Have some frozen grapes. Drink lots of water. I've been trying to double up on the water. I'm coming up with solutions rather than just being like, well, it's hot. I got to eat my fucking ice cream because I'm a big old baby. No. Because you look like shit, your body looks like shit, and, and I tell myself that. So to stop myself from telling myself that, I need to stop eating ice cream. <laughs> oh, shit. I think the most important thing is, uh, I mean, that whole clip that I played was is very important, but the whole important thing is, or uh, that I pulled out from that was that we have lives to be lived. We need to be gra- grateful for the love that we received. And I can tell you guys that, you, you're aware, if you're a regular listener of my show, you're fully aware that I haven't always had the best relationship with my parents. 
Um, I mean, I would say that I'm somewhat closer to my mom, but not really. I, I really don't talk to her about personal, too personal of stuff or too personal of things because I think if I'm vulnerable in front of her, it makes me look weak. And then she, be, she becomes more bossy. Like if I've got a problem, her solution is just to be more bossier to me. And that's not helpful. I just would like somebody to listen and maybe offer some suggestions that I can think about or consider rather than just tell me or point out to me what mistakes I'm making and not really offer advice. I don't know. That kind of sounds weird. No. Anywho, I've just, I've had a couple of situations where my mom is extremely helpful, extremely loving, but it's almost to a point where it handicaps me, where I cannot move. It's too much. I need space. I need to be able to breathe. So I, I kind of keep a distance from that. And then as far as with my dad, well, I mean, he might as well live in China. <laughs> What's the furthest place away from Schitt's Bernardino? Um, oh, maybe Antarctica? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll go ahead and just say Antarctica. <laughs> or I'm podcasting live from Antarctica and my dad is in Schitt's Bernardino. That is the distance between our relationship. Um... I wouldn't say we're on bad terms. We're on decent terms. But again, I can't share anything personal with him because he's simply not paying attention. He is so focused on reading his little books. He's focused on church. He's focused on fixing things or, as I like to call, breaking them and then fixing them. Um, So our relationship is very... I wouldn't say strain, but we just don't really talk. I mean, I would say that we talk to each other probably once a week, if that. So that's uh, my father and I in a nutshell, if you've never listened to this show, is I haven't exactly been grateful of that love I've received from my parents. Even though it's been very strange and communication has been awkward and it's not very loving um, or it hasn't been as loving as I would have liked it to have been, um... I still should be grateful for that. And this week, I went to my parents' house. My dad tells me, he said, Oh, I was looking at your picture from Ellis Mania. And I was like, Oh, I didn't even know you had that. He's like, Well, I do. I'm like, Okay. <sighs> Just um, seeing his face, looking at my picture, I it really fucked me up because... Half the time when I'm around my dad, he won't even look at me. And when he does, it's for a moment. It's to tell me what needs to be done or what's what's going wrong. Or he's asking about someone else. And so for the first time in a while, he's, I guess, asking about me in a roundabout way or looking at this picture of me and, and his face looking at me with a belt and I said I don't I don't know what picture you're talking about is it this one so I pulled out my phone and I showed him another picture that he didn't have and he said I don't have that one it's another one so he said send me that picture so I sent him that picture and he says, I've never seen this picture of you before. And it was with, um, it was a picture with, with, um, with me and my, my teacher, my sensei and just how happy, happy my, my dad was seeing me happy. He never says anything to me about martial arts other than that I should quit and it's just too much and I shouldn't do that because I'm going to end up with brain damage and why do you need to do this why do you need to beat yourself up there are other things you can be doing and I just never thought that he respected what I did until I saw his face and how proud he was Oh, yeah, I guess. 
As you can tell, it made me uh, very emotional <laughs> because, like I said, I it's rare that my dad is a, he will look at me in the eye to begin with. And um, I swear that he's not giving me a list of things to do or what I should be doing or what I'm doing wrong. He was just... Um, Enjoying, I guess, a picture of. I guess a picture. It was a picture of my achievement. Now my audio is gonna be all fucked up because I got <laughs> stuffy. But uh, I apologize. But I guess it's just it's, uh, super crazy to see that because you know it's, it's been a long time that. I don't know. Uh, we don't really, like I said, we really don't have a relationship. So to, to see that he even cared enough to have a picture or still had a picture of me is surprising. I guess I, I should say that I'm, I'm shocked. The two years prior to that belt, leading up to that belt, I was not in a good place. I was in a horrible place. Um, no thanks to myself. No thanks to... Um, a particular X Factor who shall remain nameless. I had to basically start all over. I had to start from rock bottom and rebuild myself up. And so a check mark in the journey of creating a better version of me, I should say, and uh, creating a stronger mind. Because up until 2013, and I would say that I didn't have the strongest mind. That I didn't. That I was very weak. I might have been physically strong, but mentally I was very weak. And so flash forward to me now, that in Jan of 2013 to Jan of 2019, I would probably decimate the 2013 version of me. I would crush that Jen. Because that Jen seems so far removed of who I am. Even though that was me, those thoughts and ideas are not the same. The Jen of 2013 thought that I had everything figured out. Thought that I was probably going to get married. (laughs) That I was going to have a family. And those things did not happen. So flash forward to 2019 where I'm glad that I didn't get married. Um, I'm glad that I'm realizing that I have options for a job that I can get paid to have fun. This is crazy, right? Um, This coming, this next Saturday, I have a DJ gig and I'm getting paid to have fun. This is crazy. Um, But it's not. I can do this. I can have fun and get paid and, and, and I'm enjoying the process. I am somebody because somebody loved me despite whatever relationship my parents and I have because their love, even though it's not the love that I thought I should have, the love that they thought they gave me, which was the best that they could do, is enough to show me that, okay, this is the precipice of your love. This is awesome. Uh, Let me take your love and tweak that and then give that love to other people, other people in my life, friends and other family members. And, and maybe I guess the mistake that I'm making is I'm, I'm not turning and giving that love back to my parents. I'm keeping my distance from them. And I guess I'm doing it to protect myself because I feel like if I'm too close to them, I'm not trying to disrespect my parents. I, I am grateful for the love that they have given me. But I also know that some of the bad habits that they have, they're... If I hang around them too long, I start to pick up those bad habits. So I'm trying not to have those bad habits by simply keeping my space. Just keeping an arm's length. I see you, Mom and Dad. I appreciate you. But I also have to go keep moving forward on my journey. Because if I stay too long, if I stay too close, then I can't grow. Like I mentioned earlier, my mom's love is very suffocating. It's almost too much. And my dad's love is is not enough. I know that's the best that they can do. But in my opinion, there are things that that can be tweaked. So I take 
the mistakes and I try and and turn those mistakes into love and just pass it on. I want to try and be the best example for love that I can be. The love that I've received from my parents is the best love that they knew how to give at that moment in time based on the love that they've received from their parents. And then when I think about their situations and how their parents weren't exactly as lovey as they should have been, or as kind as they should have been, or as nice, their intention was well, um, just like my parents' intention was was loving, but they tried. They tried. They gave it their best, and I truly believe that my parents, they tried. They gave it their best, and now I'm taking those examples and making them my own and trying to spread that love amongst other people, amongst other friends and families, or even just strangers like you listening to this show I'm trying to do the best that I can do. My intention is pure. Um, I want to do no harm unless you sign the the release form. (laughs) When I hear people say, oh, you're so nice. I said, yeah, because why not? (laughs) And lastly, I want to talk about from Cornell, Dr. Cornell West on the Joe Rogan podcast number 1325, Dr. Cornell West with Joe Rogan, I highly recommend. Go listen now. Turn this off and go listen right now, okay? The last thing I want to talk about is the examples of greatness. So me being so nice is because I had nice parents showing me how to be nice. That if somebody was mean to me, I don't necessarily have to be mean back. I had a bunch of people cut me off in traffic today. I don't have to be mean back. Just let them go about their business. And I did see them at the stoplight. So it's like, what what are you in such a hurry for that you're willing to cause an accident? Chances are it's not worth it. I watch, when I watch, um, I watch a lot of um, martial arts. I watch a lot of DJ videos. I watch a lot of working out videos. I watch a lot of funny things. And, and I realize those are all of the things that I like to do. Like, I love DJing. I love picking out music and I love dancing. And so it makes sense that I try to practice for an hour a day. Sometimes it's it's never an hour. It's either I practice, either I don't practice, or it ends up being five hours. And before I knew it, I'm like, whoa, five hours is gone. Holy shit. I watch DJ videos. I practice DJing. I watch MMA videos. I practice MMA. Uh, I watch gym videos. I go to the gym. And I watch comedy b- because I love to be funny. So Even though this episode hasn't been as funny as I would have liked it to have been. That's why it's so late, because I've just been avoiding publishing it. Because I just knew it wasn't going to be as funny as what I would like it to be. But sometimes you can't always be funny, goddammit. And so don't at me that, oh, you weren't funny. Or maybe you find my tears funny. Then go on ahead and laugh. (laughs) Ah, you son of a bitch. Anyhow. If you want to be great, then you need to see examples of greatness. Whatever it is you're trying to be great at, whether it's DJing, comedy, building trucks, um, being a great Marine, or being a great veteran, or being a great veterinarian, being a great DJ, being a great mixed martial artist, you have to study greatness. In order to be great, you got to study greatness. And so I thought that was really cool from Dr. Cornell. I'm like, man... People ask me, uh, I want a podcast, but I'm not sure. How was your experience like? And I say, just do it. Just go on and do it. Podcast. Um, but it might not sound as good as yours. I'm like, well, mine sounds like shit compared to Joe Rogan's. But some of you listening who don't have a podcast at all thinks that this sounds wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got this from listening to other great podcasts like the fighter and the kid, Joe Rogan, the examples of greatness that I was listening to motivated me to do a podcast. I had to do a podcast. I couldn't, I was having dreams about it. People, I couldn't sleep. I had to get a podcast done. Every time I lay down, I wake up in the morning, I had to do a podcast. And then I'd spend the rest of the day telling myself, no, you can't do this. This is crazy. This is, this is the worst idea. No, two and a half years later, best idea. 
I'm having a blast. I'm over here crying on the radio. I'm growing as a person. I get to go back and listen to these when I have a hearing aid or whatever. And um, at the nursing home and play people like, look, everybody, I'm on the radio. <laughs> if you can hear, turn up your hearing aid and listen to this shit. <laughs> oh, shit. But in a nutshell, if you're thinking about doing a podcast, just go on and do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Even if you do a podcast once a month, then that's the podcast you do once a month. But make it motherfucking good if you're only going to podcast once a month. I mean, come on. Otherwise, you got to start cranking this out like me every week. <laughs> um, I get it. Sometimes you can't always do that. Sometimes you don't have things to say. Sometimes life is busy. I know for me, um, this is it. This is all I got. So you got me every week. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you would get even more of me if I didn't have a job. So, <laughs> But if I didn't have a job, then I couldn't afford this podcast. So... I'll take, it's a give and a take, there's a give and a take, but the good news is, I'm liking my new side job, that's DJing, and hopefully that can be my main job, I'm looking to turn that into my main job, and in order for me to do that, that means you need to tell your friends, your nieces, your nephews, your auntie, your grandma, your granddad, your tío, your uncle, your neighbor, your postman, anybody who will fucking listen to either subscribe to this show so I could get some 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 moolah so I can just do this full time or you can book me to DJ your party. How about that? DJ Jen. <laughs> oh shit. I want to talk to you guys about some current events. Holy shit, I am not going to get any sleep before work. Whatever. But I want to talk to you guys about some current events like for starters, a dad this week shot and killed the daughter's boyfriend because he was supplying her with drugs. Um, 40 something year old dad shot 17 year old boyfriend in cold blood in Pennsylvania this week after the boyfriend was caught supplying his daughter with drugs. And I say, amen. This dad should not go to jail. God bless him. He's protecting his child. I would have probably did the same thing. You're welcome. <laughs> oh man. Uh, what's such a shitty thing? I mean, <sighs> you're trying to protect your daughter. I get it. But also, you got to understand that your child has free will. She doesn't have the comprehension to understand because her frontal cortex is not developed till she's 26 years old. But at 17, she knows right from wrong because you taught her that. And so hauling off to shoot this dude is wrong. Should probably call the police, maybe rough him up a little bit, but to kill him, I mean, I'm with you on that, but I'm not, you know, there has to be another way. You need to both sit these two down and be like, look, drugs ain't the answer. If it's weed, it's, you know, it is drugs, but you'll be all right. <laughs> but, um, Jesus, what a shining example to set for our all the dads out there. <laughs> oh, fuck. I'm a mess. Anywho, I, I get it. The dad is trying to protect his daughter by any means necessary. And I'm not a parent. And like my boss says, you shouldn't listen to somebody who hasn't had a child or family to give advice. <laughs> oh, Just like I think you shouldn't listen to somebody who thinks they know it all. <laughs> um. My take on that is, yes, I would probably do the same. I would probably fuck up a motherfucker who was selling drugs to my kid. But I would also have the wherewithal to understand that at the end of the day, hopefully my teachings taught my child to say no to begin with. But if they didn't, it is at their own discretion. They are on their own. If they choose to do drugs knowing that drugs are bad, okay, that's on them. That's on my child. There was a weird conversation I ran into this week. I'm not going to say where because I don't want to. Um, I'm trying to protect the, the names of the innocent here. But a conversation happened and I approached. And it was women talking about how 
they could never be with a guy who makes less money than them. And I thought, what? Excuse me? The fuck, bitch? How about, does he beat you? Does he do drugs? Does he take care of the kids? Is he out of jail? Is he a nice guy? Does he love you? What the fuck does it matter that he makes less money than you? That's so weird. And then I realized, oh, that's the insecurity talking. It's just bizarre. What does it matter? So if you make more money than your husband, okay, you do. That just means that you do. And that's it. That doesn't make your husband any less or boyfriend any less of a person. And I just thought these two women talking about that, I was just like, oh, that's just gross. They're just insecure that you that you need somebody to take care of, that you, that you would want a man to take care of you. Like, my thought is that you should be happy that you make as much money, if not more money than a man. And, and whether you do or don't, are you happy in your relationship? If that bothers you so much, then maybe y'all shouldn't be together. But then I realized you're not in relationships where um, the man makes less more money, less money than them. They're in relationships where the husband does. So the husband makes more decisions. And so maybe they're a little upset that they don't have as much decision-making power because they make less money and therefore feel less than. Maybe y'all should worry about your relationships and not other people's. <laughs> You're in a relationship where you feel the need to have a man make more money than you. Okay, good for you. I don't care. <laughs> if a chick made more money than me, cool. I don't give a fuck. Just like I would want to be with somebody who wouldn't care that I made more money than her. What does it fucking matter? It should matter that we're in love and we're doing the right things. You know what I mean? We're taking care of business in the streets and in the sheets. All right? <laughs> uh, what does it fucking matter? It should matter that you're in love and you feel loved and... If your goal is to be in love with somebody for the rest of your life, then do that. If your goal is to be in love with somebody for the night, then do that. Or if your goal is to be in love for the rest of your life and start a family, then do that. As long as it comes from love, I think that's the most important part. Those two people in the conversation where women were missing, I think, missed the boat on that. But hey, who am I to say? I can't even fit in the boat. <laughs> it's weird engaging in a conversation with somebody you don't like. And this week, it was awkward to say the least. This uh, rando, who I like to call rando, wacko, wacko, rando, whichever you prefer, just randomly walked up to me and was like, won't you be my neighbor? Oh, excuse me. Let me correct the voice. It's not Moto Kenzo. Hey. <laughs> Hey, oh, won't you be my neighbor? Huh? I'm like, oh, God. Uh, whoa, I literally said, whoa, what's, what the fuck's going on? I'm not comfortable with you. <laughs> I'm just waiting for you to sign the release form. <laughs> Why are we having this conversation? Yeah, won't you be my neighbor? I'm like, oh, God. I don't want to be your neighbor, sweets. I don't particularly care for you. I, and it's not personal. It's just the behaviors. If this person changed the behavior, I probably would take this person out for pizza and beer. We probably wouldn't be besties, but I'm sure I would be willing to be seen in public with this person. But the fact that this person displays a behavior that is unbecoming, that is, uh, a very destructive behavior to other people, not necessarily themselves, but to others, I have a problem with. And this person does not think that their behavior is harmful to other people when it has been seen, it has been witnessed by multiple people that this person's behavior is harmful to other people. I can't support that at all. I'm not in the business of supporting somebody who brings harm to other people. So 
The fact that this person is trying to engage in a conversation with me makes me feel nauseous. And I just was like, no, <laughs> I got to go. Yeah. Don't you want to be my neighbor? I'm like, woof. No, fam. Uh, I would like you to move out of my neighborhood. <laughs> On lunch last week, I was uh, driving near a park and I saw a lady in a very well-to-do Mercedes Benz. And she had on a pair of Crocs, which most rich white people do. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, jokes. Anywho, this lady, this park is a known drug part in town. And this lady had one foot hanging out. The doors were open. One foot hanging out. And it was slumped over. And I knew she wasn't taking a nap. I just, maybe she was, but just from driving by, it was probably about maybe 60 yards away or so. No, maybe even closer than that. I would say maybe about 40 yards away. I could see her leg hanging out of the vehicle and her slumped over. And the slump over looked like it was a, a heroin slump over or a meth slump over, like you're fucked up. And um, I was like, ooh, damn. And I came to a complete stop and I looked. I was like, ooh. But I was running late from lunch, so I had to get back to work. And I was like, Fuck. I probably should have called 911 or I probably should have got out just to see if she's breathing. Then I noticed a directly parked next to her car is an EMT. The ambulance is right there. So I thought, oh, okay. Um, maybe they're on lunch. And when they clock back into work, when they make a U-turn, because there's only one way out of the park, they'll see this bitch slumped over this lady wearing Crocs. Um, that they'll do something since they saw it. So I told some friends at work and we were kind of just tripped out about it. And I said, you know, does anybody know the policy? Like if you're a paramedic, do you have to save lives while you're off the clock on lunch or do you just let them die? Like how does this fucking work? And I guess a friend of mine asked their dad, I don't know if he's an EMT or maybe he knows somebody what's going on. And basically if the EMT or the ambulance does not receive a phone call, to go to this lady that they are to keep driving by, that they are to keep moving or to ignore unless they receive a phone call due to liability. I was like, holy shit. So this lady could be dead at the park right next to an EMT, but because they don't get a phone call, they don't do anything about it. I was blown away. I was like, wow, that's hella fucked up. This bitch is dead and they're on lunch just sitting there eating their turkey sandwiches next to her. Whew, crazy. All right, I must wrap this up. It is blazing in my office. I have the AC turned off so it doesn't mess with this podcast. And I am sweating it. I'm sweating profusely. And um, I will take my shirt off. And you know why I'm taking my shirt off? Because like Derek Lewis says, my balls are hot. <laughs> How'd you take your pants off? My balls was hot. But before I go, I want to leave you with customer of the week. I had an absolute fucking weirdo who has been known to berate staff, cuss at staff, and just flat out be rude as hell. And so when this person asked me for help, they didn't just politely ask me for help. Uh, it was very rude. And then the experience got even ruder. So here we go. Hey, give me your zapper. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Give me your zapper. I was like, um, what does that mean? You know, your zapper. Give me your zapper. And he's like, I want to know the price of this. I'm like, oh, well, why didn't you say so? And then so I show him. I'm like, uh, this is where you got it from. This is the price. Well, how come the one below it is cheaper? Because mm, they're not the same size and they're not the same product. But the one below the shelf is cheaper. I want the cheap one. Okay, well, then you're free to buy the cheap one. But I want the bigger one. Well, then you're going to pay more for the bigger one. Ugh. Boom shakalaka. No. <laughs> Boom shakalaka. What the fuck does that mean? You think that's how we're supposed to communicate? Because I'm like black or whatever? Or do you just like NBA jam? I mean, what are we doing? <laughs> Boom shakalaka. Another group of individuals who do not speak English speak Spanish, and it's you know, they're I'm barely getting by with my Espanol. 
No, I blame Espanole. Um, and I'm trying to help them. And he comes back up again. And is like, where's the, where's the sleep section? I'm like, it's right in front of you. I can't see it. Well, it's right in front of you, sir. Well, can you just, it's right in front of you, sir. Oh, boom, shakalaka. Bro, come on. Why are you saying that? I don't know you. We're not on a, 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 a need to know basis. Not once did you say, hello, how are you? Uh, could I get some help? Uh, please, thank you. Nothing. It's just been, where's this boom shakalaka? That. And then he goes to tell another coworker that I was rude. And I was like, well, how is that? How do you like them apples? B-I-H. You were rude to the sweetest worker that we have in the store. Sweet little old man. And he's cussing at him. That was two Sundays prior. So by the time we got to the third Sunday, I was like, oh, no, bitch. I'm not going to have you cussing at me. I'm not putting up with that shit. So right away, I was just like, we're done. So I immediately, any rudeness level that came to me, I just deflected. I was like, phew, phew, phew. nah, not playing that game. You want to say boom shakalaka or whatever? Do your thing, boo. I'm out. I'm not I'm not playing games with you, fam. Over here telling my coworker I'm rude. No, because I'm not playing with you. I'm not playing these games. I told you what the price is. I showed you what you needed. Move along. You've already been rude interrupting people who need my attention even more than that guy does because they don't speak English. So I need to be able to concentrate. And if you're just walking up, interrupting, saying, boom, shakalaka. <laughs> that's rude. So, <laughs> again, <laughs> shug off, shakalaka. <laughs> Fuck that guy. I do have some sound clips for you. It is only one, but it is very good. Maybe two. Here we go. It's Sunday. Why the fuck not? Here we go. All right. So my first one is Billie Eilish. And this edit is done by the Cosmic 8. And I've never really heard Billie Eilish's songs all the way through. I've heard bits and pieces. But the first time I saw her, um, she looks like this frail uh, little pop star with um, 3XL shirts and random tattoos. And I immediately thought that she would have just... You know, because her persona is very large, I just figured that she would have the tiniest, ha, 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 uh, like, wispy voice, rapping or whatever. So, just rapping. And I've heard bits and pieces of her songs, and <laughs> they're okay, but my initial reaction was pretty spot on. That is, ha, 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 ha. So, the Cosmic 8 made a whole minute of it, and it's wonderful. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no disrespect to Billy Eilish, but that's hilarious. <laughs> and finally, I want to end it with Tommy, big time Tommy, big time Tommy from New Jersey. He's got some words of advice for you, and I hope you enjoy it. I know that I have. Here is big time Tommy. But before I go, please like, share, and subscribe to Rambo for Radio, RamboPerRadio.com. Uh, tell your friends, but only if they're cool. Uh, I appreciate every single one of you who listen, who give this show a chance. And if you're thinking about doing your own show, go do it. Give yourself a chance. Or maybe you're struggling to do something else. Go do it. Just just get it done. 
Make a checklist of things that you want to complete it and get them fucking done because tomorrow is not promised. There are no guarantees. The only thing certain in life is death and taxes. So we have to get out there and get the fuck after it. We all have lives to be lived and we need to be grateful for the love that we received. And I am truly grateful for the love that each and every one of you have shown me listening to this show with your subscribing, with your DMs, with your uh, walking up to me and repeating parts of my show. I appreciate every single one of you motherfuckers. I really do from the bottom of my heart. And uh, to the future motherfuckers who might listen to this show, I appreciate (laughs) y'all so very much. This is my, my best work I've done yet. Not this episode. But this podcast, this is a journey. I know episodes aren't always going to be good. Some are going to be shit, but that's that's my journey. Not everything's roses, okay? Roses really smell like purple food. This is Rambo for Radio. And me and Big Time Tommy are signing off. How you doing, Instagram? It's Big Time Tommy. And this is how I get down on a Sunday afternoon. Listening to Freestyle, out of the boombox, on the stoop, bringing it back old school. Make America old school again. OS for life. That's right, baby. OS for life. Take it easy. This is Rambo Radio. Take it easy. I'm out.